Good morning. The midterm congressional elections in the United States normally punish incumbent presidents. Only in 1934, 1962 and 2002 <clears throat> have sitting U.S. presidents experienced the kind of favorable midterm results that Joe Biden did in these particular elections. There are no statistics for Franklin Roosevelt in 1934, but one can only imagine that at the inception, at the inception of the New Deal, he was popular. In 1962 and 2002, we do have um, numbers. John Kennedy in 1962 and George Bush in um, 2002, both respectively had approval ratings above 60%. But with 44%, Joe Biden has historically low approval ratings. So statistically speaking, Biden's election outcome is unique. Now, Biden considered these, um, the outcome of these elections a win. And on that basis, he announced that he would stand in, in 2024. Can you say that? Can you say that this is actually a win? Because the Republicans have taken control of the House of Representatives from the Democrats. But they've only done so and barely. It wasn't the expected red wave um, that many pundits predicted. In the American political system, just winning the House when the Democrats um, have the Senate and the presidency isn't enough for the Republicans to push through a new agenda. In a congressional system like the US in particular, which is characterized by highly localized political concerns rather than any national party loyalty, a thin majority in the House also means that Republicans are always vulnerable to individual defections or abstentions in particular votes. But this year's promise uh, by Republicans um, to copy Newt Gingrich's Republican Revolution, the revolution that took over Congress in 1994 for the Republicans after 42 years in the political wilderness, is in fact a, a sort of back to the future moment um, that sought inspiration from the originator of the Republican extremism, that's, that is Gingrich that has ever since polarized the US Congress into what has become a sort of non-performing institution and something which has uh, generally made the federal system almost ungovernable ever since. It seems, however, that the system is fighting back. The question poses itself, are we seeing through the fog of US politics a potential end to ideological madness. So let's ask the question, why is this um, outcome unique? There are three takeaways, the third of which um, is an important point that indicates that there is a shift taking place in American politics. So the first takeaway, the vote's unique outcome has a lot to do with the fact that it was a vote against a previous president rather than against an incumbent president. It was a vote, it was a vote against Donald Trump. That's the first takeaway. This takeaway, Trump himself doesn't seem to have internalized. Totally, I mean, typically ignoring his defeat, he's announced his candidature for 2024. Now, the Republican losses were weighted, heavily weighted against election denying candidates, in particular those among them who were newcomers. Election denying being less of a statement about what these candidates believed about the 2020 results as such and more of a statement of support for Trump. The failure of a Republican win combined 
with an unusually low, slow vote count, especially in Arizona, Georgia and Nevada, naturally has raised suspicions among Trump supporters about the voting process. Now, the situation in Arizona and Nevada, unlike Georgia, is fairly clear. Georgia, there are rules about runoffs uh, for candidates who don't get more than 50 percent. So the situation in Georgia is quite clear. The situation in Arizona and Nevada, on the other hand, does bear little comment. This has been caused by what is, in fact, an unusually high mail-in ballot um, in urban areas uh, in what are essentially desert states with very highly concentrated political constituencies. In fact, that's all there is to it. Claims of electoral fraud among conservatives have been rife since 2020. But if you look back at the 2016 election that brought Trump to power, you find that actually a third of all ballots were sent in by mail. Also, if you look at the nine countries in the world, with the, which all of which all of which have a good track record of mail voting, among those are Canada, Germany, the UK, and the US. Um, we have empirical studies for all those countries that have demonstrated a very low risk of fraud in mail voting. So, concentrating on electoral fraud is, I think, simply a distraction from the main arguments. The lesson here is that where midterm elections are normally referenda on an incumbent president, this election turned things around. It turned public's attention onto Trump. But crucially, we have to note that this was no fluke. First of all, you have the fact that there's an astonishing $16.7 billion that was spent on this these midterm elections by both parties, I think, about equally. Um, and this breaks the previous record that was set in 2018 of $13.7 billion. What is significant here, though, is that the Democratic Party counterintuitively funded many election denying Republican candidates, especially the neophytes, against their more sober colleagues in the primary selection process of the Republican Party. Democra eventually, Democratic Party candidates in the final elections who faced those election denying Republicans, those Republicans who won their primaries with Democratic funding, um, the De Democratic Party candidates that faced them in the final elections won easily. There is this fact, and, but also as associated with that, Biden's two extraordinarily ominous and hectoring electoral campaign speeches in which he target, targeted MAGA election, election deniers as the enemy within are what helped to put Trumpism on the ballot. The two, the two speeches, you had um, the soul of America speech in front of Independence Hall in Philadelphia, where Biden appeared like Dracula against a red lit background. And there was the vote for uh, the vote for democracy speech in what appeared to be an echoey sub basement of Union Station in Washington, where he made a passable impression of Joseph Stalin. Uh, unusual speeches. Um, for uh, a midterm election in the United States. In the second speech, Biden actually preempted accusations of electoral fraud by the MAGA crowd, knowing that large mail-in voting might cause delays. And he asked the public to be patient with the counting process. So these were very well thought out speeches and they had a purpose. It was here that we see a conscious Democratic Party strategy to steer the election in the unusual direction it took. But that isn't all, because the organs of state colluded in this demonization process when the Department of Justice and the FBI 
took a, took the unheard of step of raiding an ex-president's home when they raided Trump's place at Mar-a-Lago on August the 8th. Ironically, almost exactly, well, actually, exactly three months before the elections. The mainstream media helped things along by publishing articles about the horrendous nature of the stuff Trump had taken home with him in his boxes from um, the White House. And the Washington uh, Post talked about nuclear files and so on. But that was total rubbish. Um, many analysts, analysts have reported on this. Nothing was actually found and no charges have been leveled since. And uh, all of that means that the whole thing was just a setup to outlaw Trump in the public eye before the elections. So while the, the Democratic National Congress put Trump on the ballot, the organs of state outlawed him. That would normally have caused a furious reaction by the public in the, in the, in the following elections, but actually it didn't. It didn't because there were other things that were going on. One of them is, and that's, this is the second takeaway, one of them was that Trumpism isn't only associated with election denying. Um, there was a high youth, youth uh, turnout in the vote. The youth came out to vote for two things, for abortion rights and in support of Biden's student loan forgiveness scheme. Student loan forgiveness scheme. Abortion rights actually polled slightly below concerns about inflation. Um, inflation was, the, was, was overall the top concern in, in, in the polling. But, the, but it seems that the composition of voters meant that those who actually turned up to vote tilted towards those who cared more about abortion, abortion rights and about inflation. Youth is defined as the sort of 18 to 29 age range, age range. This increased remarkably from a normal 20% of the total vote for the average midterm election to 31%, so a significant rise. From an intensity perspective, also, there was a, a wherever there was a Democratic win, like John Fetterman's win in Pennsylvania, turnout was much higher than in Republican held seats. So Trumpism was on the ballot also because of the abortion issue. And we have to go back and consider, you know, how closely Trump is connected with the um, Supreme Court decision um, that, that denied the constitutional right to abortion, um, which was established back in 1973 in the Roe versus Wade decision. It is closely associated with Trump because the th of the three conservative judges he appointed to the bench, well, all three uh, of the conservative judges he appointed to the bench during his single term played a decisive role in the outcome. When you consider that the vote was six, four, and three against, and then those three judges were an important factor in this decision being passed. Moreover, these appointments were all unusual and involved, you know, Republican maneuvering in every single case. Neil Gorsuch, for instance, who got onto the court at the very beginning of Trump's presidency, only got in because the um, Senate Judiciary Committee, controlled by Republicans, ignored uh, Obama's appointment of a liberal judge at the end of Obama's term um, and just waited for Trump to come along and make a different appointment, which they could then confirm. Uh, the, the, the Republicans at the end of um, uh, Trump's term changed the rules again in their favor um, when Amy Comey Barrett was, um, was appointed and confirmed by the Republicans in the last days of Trump's presidency. And in between those two judges being appointed and confirmed by the Republicans, you had Brett Kavanaugh's appointment and confirmation um, which was marred by rape allegations against him going back to his student days. But this didn't stop the Senate Judiciary Committee from confirming him 
despite the fact that the, the witness appeared very credible. Not surprising then that Trump was closely associated with Supreme, Supreme Court judgment. But we mustn't forget that equally important, the youth vote also supported Biden's student loan forgiveness scheme, which is contested by Republican dominated states in court at the moment and is being blocked. So that's the second takeaway. The third takeaway is the most important. We come here, um, we see here the mirror image of, of the second takeaway. So if you had a, a, a greater youth vote, there is logically a lesser vote share from the older generations. In fact, the older male white working class voters largely stayed at home during this election. So the share of older vo voters, those who cared more about inflation, declined in, in relative terms. And this happened in the context of an overall drop in turnout compared with the turnout in 2018. So you had a drop in turnout from 49% to 47%. And within that 47%, there was an unusual rise, large rise in the youth vote from 20% to 31%. That changed the calculus uh, considerably. So why did these older voters stay at home? Essentially, it turns out, you know, if you look at it carefully, Biden's pro-union stance resonated with many of them. His stance became particularly clear in the case of unionization at Amazon. By contrast, the Republican manifesto, the so-called commitment to America, that's trying to ape the Gingrich contract with America, went completely the other way. The, Re the Republicans want to unwind Biden's pro-labor appointments to the National Labor Relations Board. They want to promote a lot of anti-labor leg leg legislation. They want to slash the minimum wage and they, they want to repeal sick leave legislation in, in all states and mun municipalities. I said that this third takeaway is significant because it signals a shift that is taking place in American politics. In that regard, we have to remember the most significant factor in the shift to the right in American politics since 1968, first at the level of the presidency and then by the, the late 80s and 1990s at the level of Congress, has been the shift of the white union vote and its long standing rejection of civil rights and workplace and community integration. It is this shift which led um, the, um, the white union vote ultimately self-destructively to make common cause with ultra conservatives in the, in the Republican Party. Ultra conservatism in America, especially the religious right, isn't popular in, in of itself. It has only been its alliance with the white union vote that gave it legs. And it was this alliance that fractured the liberal labor alliance that had underscored the post-war Keynesian New Deal consensus of the 50s and 60s. So we have to ask ourselves, could it be that greater racial harmony in the workplace and in communities means a de uh, intensifying of the cultural wars? Despite what we see, do you think, you know, will we see a, a, a pushback against ultra-conservatism? At the level of society, it does begin to look like it. At the level of the political economy as well, as I just noted, we are increasingly seeing the kind of alliance between the presidency and the unions that existed during the Vietnam War. Presidents, because of their power over appointments to the National Labor Relations Board and to the Supreme Court, can set the tone for such an alliance. And Biden is, in fact, doing this. He is setting a new tone. Trump had actually sailed into his presidency on his promises of reshoring industry, creating more jobs and launching a trade war with China. 
And while Biden has actually made these policies his own, the anti-labor politics in the Republican manifesto means that he becomes, Biden that is, the sole inheritor of the positive side of Trump's agenda. In fact, if you look closely at the Republican um, economic package, it was astonishingly divorced from reality. It was like something out of the 1920s. It, it resembled the stuff Liz Truss came up with in Britain before she was fired uh, after 40, 40, 45 days as British Prime Minister. McCarthy and Truss actually both got their ideas from essentially the same sources, neoliberal think tanks populated by aging whiz kids, nostalgic for the days of the 1970s when people seemed to take them seriously. Kevin McCarthy, the Republican uh, leader, and his bunch drank from the water cooler at the Heritage Found Foundation. Um, it was the Heritage Foundation that wrote all of N Ronald Reagan's policies when the Gipper first became president. But even then, they were so extreme that he had to row back on them, um, especially on the tax cuts, in his second term. The average person can now recognize these neoliberal whiz kids at a distance. They know them now for the parasites that they are. And the spell of neoliberal ideas is broken. They understand the equation between austerity and neoliberalism. This neoliberal, proposed neoliberal austerity in, in the commitment to America for the midterm elections this year, like all austerity, was going to be paid for by the average person. McCarthy's Republican pro program is to cut taxes to the rich and at the same time boost defense spending to maintain the war with Russia and Ukraine and astonishingly to start a new one with China, which even a warmongering Biden isn't planning. This level of hawkishness is even out of step with conservative think tanks funded by donors like Charles Koch, who are putting for who are pushing for a for, for a more isolationist stance in foreign policy. So given that they want to increase defense spending at the same time as cutting taxes, how did they plan to cut the deficit, which is their main aim? Through cuts in Social Security and Medicare, of course, and also by cutting funding to public schools, although they want to increase uh, faith-based schools and give them tax breaks and, all, and, and, and also through the evisceration of environmental protection and also through the unchecked exploitation of fossil fuels, uh, again, giving special uh, deals to uh, and, and tax cuts to energy companies. Furthermore, the Republican commitment to America pushes the religious and ultra, ultra conservative agenda in every direction even hawking anti-vaccination ideas that ban all requirements to have healthcare workers vaccinated for deadly viruses. The Republican leaders obviously got lost in all this ideological stuff and, 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 and failed to keep the essence of Trump's original message, that it's all about jobs and decent wages, ending what Trump called at the in his inauguration speech, American carnage. Biden and the Democrats, on the other hand, ironically, got the message, the message that was delivered by this Trumpian disruption. And they made a plan. Biden's Build Back Better program, however, you know, became, you know, came to be watered down into the Inflation Reduction Act because of Democratic senators like Joe Manchin, well, particularly Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, who were pandering to their corporate donors and exploited outdated rules in the Senate to uh, block many provisions um, of the plan. But nevertheless, the Inflation Reduction Act is a sign of the slow return of a Keynesian New Deal approach to, political, to the American political economy and to the end of neoliberal 
Obamanomics. But I want to point out here that there will also in the future be a, a, a major difference this time around in the 2020s to the 1950s when yeah, at the height of the Keynesian New Deal political economy. It's not only about a rebalancing in the relationship between labor and capital any longer. It's also within the category of capital um, that there has been a fast growing inequality between firms. The neoliberal regime that began with the Trade Act of 1974 that set the foundations for the structuring of globalization through the General Agreement for Tariffs and Trade, through NAFTA, through the Uruguay round of trade negotiations that led to the establishment of the World Trade Organization and that then led to the inclusion of China in the WTO, ultimately these structures benefited only a very few, very large multinationals, creating a monopolistic capitalist system internationally, represented, as we all know, at Davos in the World Economic Forum. This inequality between firms has been considerably exacerbated by the dynamics of the monetary policy of quantitative easing since 2009, since the crash of 2009. And this concentration of capital is one of the main reasons for sharp declines in US productivity. And this becomes of crucial importance in a new age of international competition with Chinese firms. This competition with Chinese firms is becoming the main driver of change in the American political economy. This is why Biden, the Biden's administration, established a new antitrust regime in the uh, 2021 presidential executive order, which instructed antitrust agencies to increase enforcement to prevent price gouging, which is a major cause of inflation at the moment, to prevent competitive harm in labor markets and to protect nascent competition to protect competition that is coming from buyouts and unfair pricing, uh, which has been rife over the past 40 years. The, 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 the habit of large corporations of pricing newcomers out of, the, out of the market, and if they are unsuccessful in doing that, buying them out. And this was quite an ambitious executive order because it, it, it ordered a whole of government competition policy where more than a dozen agencies altogether were instructed to protect competition using their authority under a wide range of statutes. And this, this whole thing um, also involved the appointment of many um, new people in the antitrust agencies um, the most um, high profile of which was Lena Khan, who was appointed chair of the Federal Trade Commission. Um, Lena Khan is, was famous f for writing a critique of Amazon. So Biden's reshoring policy is accompanied by a new competition strategy, which, by the way, will gain the support of the majority of corporations through organizations like the Business Roundtable, due to the skewed outcomes, um, the, stu the skewed outcomes caused by the neoliberal world order within the category of capital that transpired since the Trade Act of 1974. In fact, the Business Roundtable, along with its affiliate organizations, the Committee for Economic Development and the Emergency Committee for American Trade, um, these were all crucial contributors to the formation of the neoliberal world order um, during the negotiations in Congress over the Trade Act of 1974. But reshoring is also accompanied by rewiring supply chains for resiliency in the new world being reshaped by the superpower politics between China and America, one in which the US presidency assumes a crucial role 
within the American political sphere because of its considerable autonomy over both trade and foreign policy. Certainly, Biden's address to the Business Roundtable last March after the start of the Ukraine war appears to show a fairly compliant corporate community. There is, of course, a darker side to all of this as the Ukraine war takes the place of the Vietnam War at the centre of a new division of the world into blocks that is taking place. Dangerous fictions like Russiagate are generated by the Democratic National Congress with impunity and we see the covering up of Biden family sleeves with the help of the FBI which was famously outed um, by Mark Zuckerberg on the Joe Rogan radio show. And this is all part of the new phase of politicization of the bureaucracy, which I noted earlier in relation to the, to the raid on Mar-a-Lago, and the greater media censorship, um, demonizing, um, institutionalizing the demonization of Trump and Trump supporters. So with the Ukraine war becoming the linchpin of uh, a new geopolitical restructuring, the establishment seems now to be intent uh, on learning from the Vietnam War in seeking to control dissent and anti-war settlement in more effective ways. On this, actually, the U.S. establishment is closely allied with big tech. This, this is not just the state calling in its debt from the time it nurtured the birth of Silicon Valley in the 1990s. This is also Google and Amazon in particular taking on major contracts with the intelligence services and the defense department. When it comes to um, the countries of Europe, on the other hand, when it comes to this new creation of blocks, the United States is reasserting a fact that has lain dormant since the end of World War II, namely that Europe, and Germany in particular, is conquered ter territory. I'll come back to this um, and the geopolitical situation in my next video. But to conclude, to conclude here on the domestic political situation in the United States, um, we might say that it looks like the Republican Party will be increasingly marginalized due to its short-sightedness and its extremism. And by the divisions within its ranks that will be caused by Trump's decision to run in 2024, unless he withdraws. And trends seem to be conspiring to gradually begin to reduce the debilitating impact on politics of the ideological divisions in American society. Biden's decision to run, on the other hand, <laughs> will create a serious Brezhnev dilemma for the Democratic Party that I believe only taxidermists might be able to solve. Thank you for listening.